good evening i'm rain chief kurup i am representing abdid maritime branch a joint institution of rena imr standardisis uh, welcome all of you to this technical event today we have ian nash from sps technology talking about repairs using sand display systems just to give a brief introduction of ian he is the marine and offshore business manager for sps technology and works with a wide range of global clients advising on class approved composite structural steel repairs so with the sps technology team ian is on a quest to ensure composite structural repairs are seen as standard repair options and no longer a new technology ian has worked on projects globally with most of the oil majors and taken part in a number of maritime research and development projects after studying engineering at a level ian joined the royal navy ian is qualified as a lead marine engineer on destroyers and studied marine engineering at portsmouth university before beginning his 13 years and he says still counting journey with sps technology so over to you ian um before i hand over to ian sorry um we have if you have any questions please type on the slide or link that has been provide provided by imrs when you registered for the event the the code is repair uh, so if you can in slide or if you type repair as give a code as repair and then you should be able to to ask questions at the end of the session there's no problem even if you want to enter your questions in between we will be monitoring the the slido and at the end we'll be presenting those questions to ian and ian can answer those specifically uh, over to ian Thank you very much. Uh, good evening and, and thank you for inviting me to give this presentation on repairs using SPS, which of course stands for sandwich plate system. Please note that this uh, presentation along with my speaker notes added to the slides will be available at the end of the presentation should you wish to request them. During the presentation, I'm going to give an introduction to SPS, provide a summary of the benefits and applications, approvals, and round it off with some examples of some interesting projects where SPS has been used. We'll touch upon our well-established no hot work repairs and also have an in-depth look at how SPS can help in areas where there are cracks. As you can see from this agenda slide, there's a tennis stadium and a bridge. These are part of our SPS civil engineering department, along with building the walkways to the space shuttle out of SPS panels for NASA. There's some other interesting projects on our website, so check those out if you have some time but for now let's delve into the maritime and offshore world of SPS. We all know that structural maintenance on vessels and assets is growing both in terms of demand and complexity. This requires a new innovative viewpoint and an overhaul of decades old approaches to steel strengthening, renewal and reinstatement utilizing composite materials for standard and unique applications such as a no hot work solution where welding is not possible or crack repairs in heavily loaded areas. using the sandwich plate system to unlock cost, time, environmental and safety benefits. We need to move away from this natural siloed way that companies think and start sharing these repair techniques to make the industry more efficient. So sandwich plate system, what is it and why is it used? It's a structural composite material, two metal plates bonded by a polyurethane elastomer core. The core itself provides global support to face plates so there's no weak spots or local buckling. It's a high stiffness to weight ratio. It's a superior alternative to stiff and steel and reinforced concrete. And as I mentioned, widely used in civil, maritime and industrial applications. It can be used from a new build side of things or in situ repair or upgrade to an existing asset. There are many other additional benefits such as excellent energy absorption as the polyurethane core is a solid elastomer so it's got noise and vibration deadening properties also uniquely we've got protection against impact blast ballistics and fire 
not to mention the competitive economics of using SPS over traditional methods. Our studies show that for typical uh, marine projects um, were four times faster and for offshore projects in the way of hull plating of an FPSO or pontoon of a semi-sub were actually 10 to 11 times cheaper. During this presentation, you may see um, numbers that denote, uh, say, for instance, 820E. That means it's an eight millimeter top plate on top of a 20 millimeter PU core, which sits on top of the existing corroded steel. So eight millimeter top plate, 20 millimeter core, E is for existing. During the presentation, um, different designs will be denoted by different numbers. In this slide, we can see a before and after slide of a coastal bolt carrier that has had SPS applied. On the left-hand side, you can see before there's heavily dishing in between the frame members, longitudinally and transverse, which then pool water, which adds again to the corrosive environment, um, not to mention the cargo that it was carrying um, and making it very difficult to discharge that cargo if it's uh, loose. Afterwards, SPS, the existing deck remains in place. SPS is applied on top, complete flat new deck. And as we can see here with the um, image below, it shows in between the stiffeners, the undulation of the corroded existing plate, having a new top plate placed on top, sitting on top of the perimeter bars. And I've got a video in a minute that I'll come on to show how that's installed to give a bit of a better understanding for the rest of the presentation of how easy it is to install SPS. So this is our video. It's a uh, standard deck. Oh, sorry, that didn't work. It's a standard deck on a ship or an asset. Same process applies. This is gonna be a hot work solution um, where we're gonna weld the bars to the existing deck. As you can see there, the deck is blasted back to SA2.5-60 microns. The bars are put down on top of the existing steel, um, right on top of where the underdeck stiffeners are. It's welded. Any holes are blanked off. In this case, new lashing pots are put into place. There can be new penetrations. And put spaces in the middle to stop the top plate from bowing down. If you can imagine this plate is going to be 2 meters wide by 10 meters long, so large areas. And top plates welded to the bars, and then the four corners ventilation ports are drilled with funnels. Across the center of the panel, we put strong back beams to stop the panel from lifting during the injection phases. And then we inject our uh, two-part chemical mixture, which is injected at the low point of the cavity. It's injected in at a, as a liquid. As it flows through the cavity, it comes up through the ventilation ports, making sure there's no air pockets um, formed. After 10, 15 minutes, it goes through an exothermic reaction where it exchanges from a liquid to a solid and it grips the top plate at the bottom plate and then pulls them together as it solidifies, forming um, one complete panel. The unique thing about SBS is that these panels can be joined together um, so that you've got continuity across the top plate, adding to the global strength. So SPS versus stiffened steel, as you can see in this um, slide, the top traditional stiffened steel, quite complex in comparison to the second image where SPS is. Um, the primary stiffeners are common for both, but uniquely for the SPS, you do not need the under deck stiffening, secondary stiffening um, in between those primary stiffeners when you're using SPS. If you can imagine the SPS sample in between the two pieces of plate, acts like a million little stiffeners as it is. In the bottom section here, we show a new build um, section uh, prefabricated in one of our many facilities globally. On the right hand side, we put this photo, this photo of a heli deck. And I'll come on to that example a little bit later on. But what's unique about this is that it happens in situ. And uh, for weight saving, SPS actually can use lighter uh, steel materials such as um, aluminium uh, or hollow box sections. So SPS here for the repair and conversion, superior to conventional crop and replace in our view. On-site application, extremely fast process, no structural removal. It's non-disruptive because the existing plate stays in place. It's safe. 
better than new structural performance, minimizes labor content and downtime, and is used in a wide range of applications. Some other key benefits that we have from the previous slide is to eliminate stiffeners. So it makes a simplified structure, which then helps as we look at fire and impact resistance and fatigue and corrosion resistance and reduce through life maintenance. So as we can see on this slide here, speaking of fire resistance, if you look at the top left-hand photograph, a plate's been exposed to uh, 945 degrees fire for 60 minutes. And it's red hot and it's, it's lost its structural integrity. It's lost its strength. Um, as we say, it's only, if only it had been an SPS panel, <laughs> uh, because the SPS panel on the top right-hand side of this slide is exposed to the same conditions. And we can see from the results detailed between the two photos that the temperature experienced um, on the red hot steel versus the SPS um, is vastly different. The polyurethane core for the SPS panel is a very low K value, allowing the SPS panel to remain cool and retain its strength. SPS has been tested against cellulose stick, carbo, carbo, hydrocarbon and jet fires. So we've got the uh, certificates for A60, H120 and J60 fire ratings. So protection against extreme oil and gas product fires. So the thing to remember here is that an SPS panel can be constructed to meet your design criteria. Built-in blast and ballistics protection. Um, so these photographs here, the, the top left-hand one, is a uh, test that was completed at Carter Rock in the United States to see if um, United States warships, if they were made out of, uh, if the hull was made out of uh, SPS rather than just sheet steel, would it um, be able to withstand a blast? As you can see in that photograph, the sheet steel has been penetrated, whereas the SPS has remained intact. Similarly, for some of the testing we've done, uh, making citadel doors for vessels that transit in pirate areas, the SPS ballistics tests, where um, we have uh, made bulletproof doors, essentially, um, retrofitted to the ships um, to provide safe citadel access. Uh, bottom three photographs show the blast enclosure um, for our escape tunnel testing. So what's interesting about this is that uh, the, the oil major uh, wanted a two, a two bar blast pressure and we put it to 2.3 and it still withstood it. The SPS plastically deforms, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't break, there's no through penetration from, from blast. As you can see from uh, that photograph that on the bottom right that's got a white line going through it, we didn't just want to test an SPS panel on its own, we wanted to test two SPS panels joined together and see um, would it and pass the test uh, to, for it to um, to withhold that blast pressure. So SPS from those four photographs we can see is superior to sheet steel. It absorbs the blast energy, prevents rupture and tearing, it blocks shrapnel, preserves structural integrity and limits secondary damage, which for any offshore asset, um, the primary uh, damage from, from the explosion, you need to watch out for the secondary damage from the subsequent fire, etc. Um, so we designed an FPSO with uh, the oil major now operating in the North Sea. The fully, full structural integrity is going to be maintained, protection against further blasts and subsequent fire, as I said. So uh, on the subject of testing, you know, SPS, there have been over 12,000 independent tests carried out for SPS applications. So this is a well-established technology. As you can see from this slide, SPS is class approved by all major classification societies as a permanent repair and written into their rules and guidelines. Um, SPS, unlike other uh, composite materials, is not classed as a temporary repair. It's a permanent uh, repair solution and has stood the test of time. It's been in service on, on some vessels and assets for more than 20 years. It's got a, an amazing track record. As you can see from this slide, there's some patch and wrap repairs in the market. Um, the temporary composite wrap repairs for damaged structures, they can be repaired and protect against the effects of erosion and corrosion, deterioration, uh, but they're tempor temporary composite patch repairs. 
and that uses carbon and glass fibers mixed with epoxy resin and adhesive and applied to the damaged surface. By curing the resin hardens and permanently bonds to the surface, it's a well-established um, well established repair, uh, same with the patch repairs. Um, SPS, again, as we mentioned, fully class approved permanent repair um, that's been used on marine structures for over 20 years. We now move on to some specific applications that uh, look really interest our, our offshore customers um, that's using the SPS no hot work solution. As we see in the slide, the SPS no hot work solution has been in service for 17 years. This is by no means a new technology. This is very much an established technology. In this picture, we can see the main deck of an FPSO. The original plating is thinned down to 50% globally. So the SPS no hot work solution is, a, is, is ideal to reinstate this deck. So you don't need to um, use extensive scaffolding and cleaning of the cargo oil tanks below. As per the video at the top of the presentation, the same principle applies. The perimeter bars are positioned above the under deck stiffeners. They're bolted or adhered to the original deck and then the new plate is positioned on top of the perimeter bars, where it's again bolted or adhered to, to the bars to form an airtight cavity. The PU is pumped into the cavity as a liquid, and then it solidifies bonding the new plate to the existing plate. To my knowledge, SPS no hot work solution is the only solution to structurally reinstate the deck in a continuous manner because each cavity shares a perimeter bar with another cavity, another cavity giving you top plate continuity and strength all over the deck. <clears throat> For the no hot work solution in summary, SPS permanently reinstates offshore assets <clears throat> to beyond original capacity. It's accepted by major classification societies and published in class rules and guides. It's a proven technology underpinned by 20 years of market experience. It's faster, safer, more predictable repair schedule because you're not removing the existing um, plating. Uh, most cost effective can be, as I said earlier on, up to 11 times cheaper, four times faster than, than crop and renew. Um, contributes to global strength. There's no maximum repair size because the plates um, share the, can share, adjoining cavities can share the same perimeter bar. So you maintain that top plate continuity. Uh, the largest no hot work repair that we had approved on a main deck was by ABS, and that was 841 meters squared on an FSO. Permanent repair solution with no risk of further corrosion to the existing plate. So once the SPS is applied to that existing plate, it then seals it from corrosion from, from the top side uh, where the SPS is applied. Uh, as I mentioned, we can design the SPS to meet uh, your design criteria um, in individually tailored solutions uh, to match the asset lifespan. So if you're looking to extend your asset by 10 or 20 years, then SPS can, can offer those um, timelines. Uh, flexibility where we can install SPS globally um, by an international network of uh, licensees. Um, SPS is a proven life extension. Um, welding and grinding is eliminated. Coffer down and dive boats, which are very expensive, are eliminated. Um, and I we've had a, the original no hot work solution that was a permanent repair installed back in 2003. So yeah, 17 years, longest established operator in the field of composite repairs. Now, looking at this photograph, it's clear to see that the vessel crack on this uh, vessel is beyond the wrap or patch or even the SPS repair at this point, but the image is very impactful to say the least. So we're going to talk about vessel and asset cracks. Um, and we've got a, an example uh, we'd like to discuss during this presentation. So repairing the cracks present on, on vessels or assets, critical structural components forms a key part of structure and maintenance. It preserves the asset integrity. More importantly, it ensures crew safety and the safe passage of cargo. The global oil and gas fleet is aging. There's new stress points emerging on existing vessels. And as a result of retrofitting and refits, 
work that is vital in prolonging the life of an asset or vessel and ensuring cost-effective compliance with environmental regulations. These factors mean that the demand for structural maintenance, including crack repairs, is greater and more complex than ever before. For many years, gouging and rewelding or crop and renewal tech week techniques have been used to address cracks on vessels. While effective, the process involves extensive steel renewal, which is costly, time consuming, and comes with heightened risk of time out of service. So over the next few slides, we'll examine how the combination of these factors suggest an overhaul is required in the industry's approach to crack repair. While repair techniques have remained static for many years, structural composites can offer a cost competitive alternative that's fast, non-disruptive, and delivers improved strength compared to conventional steel structures. As you see on the slide here, cracks related to an accident or a collision are a little bit different, you know, form a dent or deformation on the ship's hull structure, geometric misalignment of support structure, crack forms at the weakest link and can lead to catastrophic failure. But steel structures can develop cracks as a result of their all welded construction, material imperfections, loading conditions, fatigue, corrosion, as they operate in highly corrosive environments. Welded structures are susceptible to damage during its construction and operational life. Other factors which can't really be taken into account in the early stages, such as design inadequacies or material selection, material imperfections, improper welding, incorrect fabrication, maybe even poor workmanship, are some of the probable causes for damage during construction, while fatigue and corrosion are really related to the operational side. These damages primarily manifest as cracks in the ship structure, either immediately after fabrication and launching or in due course of time. Crack formation or initiation, or initiation appears inevitable or unavoidable given the uncontrolled variables involved in the construction of welded structures, along with other factors, including the use of high tensile strength steel for uh, a hull structure. This is an example on this slide of a project of where the crack in the hull of an FPSO, this FPSO was lengthened, and the cracks were formed in the area of the new connection to the old. Defect crack locations are in the aft portion of the hull, which is the original section. Backing brackets were not installed along the side shell longitudinal stiffeners during uh, the conversion. Cracks originally appeared at the bulb or the collar plate weld connection at the aft side of the bulkhead. Backing brackets were fitted during this repair. Excuse me a second. Cracks initiated at the new bracket toe return and propagated through the longitudinal stiffener web and into the side shell plating above and below. Existing temporary repairs were completed short after the shortly after the cracks were found using a temporary doubler plate. And as you can see from the, the diagram here on the left-hand side, um, it shows the upper doubler and lower doubler in position behind the stiffeners. The stiffeners were renewed as a temporary measure, but the cracks still uh, remained behind the doubler. So SPS was then chosen to um, be installed to strengthen these areas. And as you can see um, through these photographs, the longitudinals um, where they were crack underneath the stresses. So for the SPS solution, um, we actually applied a patch on the outside of the Amico patch on the outside of the uh, shell. Prior to applying the patch, we inspected each crack arrestor hole um, and we made sure that uh, the crack had stopped propagating. We then marked out a cut line in the longitudinal stiffener and we carefully uh, cut away the stiffener web, web and ground the remaining web edges square. We needed to remove the upper and lower doubler plates, remove the existing wooden bungs in the holes and fit new blast plugs. And then we're going to grind the cracks to create a smooth open profile. Surface preparation for this, we prepared the surface uh, to uh, have a surface roughness of greater 60 microns. 
um, where the cracks were, and we applied moisture tolerant sealant before putting the SPS on. Then we fit and tack welded the backing bars around the framework, as you can see in red here on the left hand side image. The backing bars were attached to the longitudinal framing and the transverse bulkhead so that all the welding took place away from the hull. So there was no need for water back welding procedures here. Then we fit the top plates on top of those um, backing strips and welded the plates to those strips. So again, no heat transferring through to the hull with, uh, with the, the sea on the outside. Once the steel and the welds were cooled, uh, all welds were visually inspected and 100% uh, MPI'd. As you can see here, all the plates are in place and the new stiff longitudinal stiffeners are, are back in place. We carried out a cavity leak and humidity test and then we injected the SPS elastomer core. Um, so you can see there on the left hand side the image uh, for the, the diagram and then on the right hand side the photograph was actually installed. The FEA and fracture assessment was calculated, assuming a full diesel tank and the fatigue assessment is performed with a dynamic external pressure for the loaded condition for all load cycle for 20 years. The calculated dynamic pressure corresponds to the largest stress range during a service life of 20 years. By using SPS, the stress range decreased by 95% compared to how the side shell will be without any extra stiffening. Class calculations showed that the SPS panel between the existing stiffeners contributed to a low stress level in the cracks and the fatigue analysis showed low probability for further crack growth. On the classification side for the application of the steel parts of the SPS solution, a review of the drawings checked if materials selected were acceptable with respect to manufacturing method, weldability and material testing. In the classification drawing review, they also covered acceptable details according to the rules for fabrication and testing of offshore structures. So a very successful project offshore. In this slide, it's an Aframax double hull tanker crack. So the problem was the crack in way of the inner side skin knuckle were detected in one of the cargo tanks on, on this vessel. In addition to the conventional repair, it was elected to further strengthen the joint by adding SPS to the knuckle for the entire length of the tank. The objective of the SPS repair was to reduce the stress levels at the joint and also provide an additional barrier between the oil tank and the adjacent ballast tank, adding an extra margin of safety against oil entering the ballast space. So the solution here was to assess the service life fatigue performance of the knuckle joint. Structural analysis was carried out through the use of global 3D, finite, 3D finite element model of a portion of a ship extended over three cargo tank lengths and a fine mesh FE model of the hull from frame 50 to 65. And as you can see here, these are some photographs of the work being installed. The effectiveness of the SPS repair has been investigated through FE analysis using two models to represent the as-built structure and with SPS. The use of SPS as a permanent repair is effective because it significantly reduces the stress levels in the knuckle joint. With a conservative assessment of 25% reduction in stresses at the critical locations, the fatigue life is improved by approximately 2.4 times. Ice class 1A vessel. So, this project was brought to our attention by Lloyd's Register um, some years ago, following their discussions with the client regarding a life expectancy study of this already 22 year old ice class vessel. Repairs of cracked bulkhead plating between the wing water ballast spaces and the center line fuel oil tanks was the problem. No single cause can really be attributed to any of the cracks that occurred on this ship. In general, cracking appears to be a result of a number of factors that have accumulated over time compounded by the relatively long and continuous service in severe operating environments. The solution was to inhibit future crack propagation as well as eliminate the possibility of cross-contamination in the event of a crack propagating through the full thickness of the bulkhead plating using SBS. Some sample projects uh, applications that, that we have completed over the years, um, such as the FPSO side shell protection 
So FPSOs require protection on the side shell in the way of the boat landing area, usually. So the conventional solution is to have cofferdams or sponsons. Um, sponsons, there have been some reports of them falling off FPSOs um, using cofferdams or, or, or the wing tank spaces being a void reduces your cargo carrying capacity. If you've got SPS on the outside of your FPSO, that uh, cargo tank behind the hull can be used to carry cargo. Um, so it increases your cargo carrying capacity by using SPS. Um, SPS essentially eliminates the need to install coffer dams or double hulls. It's approved by Lloyd's Register, ABS, DNVGL, all major classification societies. It's got proven reliability as well. One example uh, of an FPSO side shell protection on an FPSO. I'm going to put this in to show some scale, but also uh, to show the installation. Uh, equivalent impact resistant as sponsons, as I say, eliminated the void spaces that require regular inspection and maintenance. They can be used now to carry cargo. So the whole area was over 3,000 square meters. And as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, when you see numbers donated here, such as 15 30 E, that means it was designed for a 15 millimeter top plate, 30 millimeter polyurethane core, and E is the existing hull shell plating. This vessel was classed by ABS and the repair took place in Singapore. As I mentioned earlier, that SPS can strengthen helidex. This uh, particular project, classed by ABS and again carried out in Singapore, was uh, helidex strengthened to carry heavier Russian helicopters and make sure it was CAP 437 compliant. It was completed in 17 days. Uh, there was no um, no modifications required to the underdeck structure. Um, SPS used, um, as you see here in the details, they needed an eight mil top plate, but the eight mil top plate wasn't carbon steel. It was uh, an aluminum top plate to save on weight. Um, some of the solid perimeter bars in other projects have been hollow box sections also to save on weight. FPSO in situ below the waterline repairs. We touched on this uh, when we're talking about FPSOs and, and semi-submersible pontoons. Here we have heavy grooving corrosion of longitudinals. So over this area, we were able to put eight mil top plate, 25 mil polyurethane core, and we did uh, over hundred square meters in that area. But the key point here is that it's below the waterline and all welding took place away from the shell plating. So as you can see in the diagram uh, on the right hand side of the slide, the green areas, um, the SPS extended out um, along the longitudinals so that the welding took place away from the shell plating. So this is our FPSO escape tunnel, as I mentioned earlier about blast and fire protection. This escape tunnel is 152 meters long. Um, protects from explosions and subsequent fire events. Fire regulations uh, for the design of this escape tunnel, um, I think it was exceeding uh, H60, so hydrocarbon fire for 60 minutes, and J30, jet fire for 30 minutes. Um, sorry, H60, hydrocarbon for 60 minutes, J30, jet fire for 30 minutes. And the blast uh, requirement uh, was two bar, and, and we tested it to 2.3 bar. This is to provide safe refuge and a protected means of escape all along the FPSO um, to ensure that the crew during an event can get back to safety in the accommodation block. Um, there's no internal uh, stiffeners as, as such. So it's a seamless corridor all the way through. It's got airlocks, four different airlocks along the asset to get into the escape tunnel. We Performance was verified by full scale testing. Um, and this is a unique double protection system. So it's got enhanced safety. So it's essentially an SPS tunnel inside an SPS tunnel. Uh, the outer skin provides primary protection from blast and fire. And the inner skin maintains tunnel integrity for escape for safe escape um, route back to the accommodation. So as I said, no secondary stiffeners or internal fire blanket insulation is required. And it's got radial corners um, so that the blast is deflected around the escape tunnel. This uh, escape tunnel is in operation in the North Sea for one of our clients. 
enhanced oil recovery tank. Uh, showing this slide because it uh, shows that SPS is versatile with materials. So the stainless steel SPS tank, uh, sorry, SPS lining is actually sitting on top of a carbon steel tank. So it's implied during the new build stage to protect the valuable EOR fluid from contamination. Also with SBS, as we mentioned, low K value. So it provides thermal insulation from adjacent uh, fuel oil tanks. Um, compact design, minimum weight, maximize the tank storage capacity. There's no disruption to the vessel's construction program. Um, as we can see here, it's 1,250 meters squared, um, and the technical details show that it's an eight millimeter stainless steel top plate with a 50 millimeter polyurethane core. Semi-sub dropped object protection as applied to pontoons over thruster rooms. Um, this, um, our client uh, came to us after one of the hurricanes um, in the Gulf of Mexico, a drill collar rolled off the top of the pipe rack deck and fell down to the um, pontoon section, pierced the pontoon and uh, flooded the thruster room. So the test and, and the, the task, I suppose, at hand was to design an SPS um, application that could withstand a two ton drill collar dropped from 37 meters. Um, and we successfully completed that by um, making a 20 millimeter top plate and a 50 millimeter polyurethane core. And as it mentions here, um, it was a hollow section perimeter bars to save on weight. No heat input solutions. So this is the, the, the no hot work SPS. Um, no welding involved, perimeter bars and the new top plate are adhered to the existing structure and reinstate corroded damaged areas. On the left hand side we have an above ground storage tank. Um, this was a floating roof repair where the floating roof itself was holed and corroded extensively. We had to install the SPS patches while the tank was in service. Uh, so the tank was full and we had to use uh, no hot work solution um, and eliminate any risk of, of spark. Uh, on the right hand side, we have um, a North Sea gas tight floor reinstatement um, where the gas was leading up through the gas tight floor and we needed to seal it off. And as you can see in the, the middle photograph there, um, that is a full scale testing um, onshore in Aberdeen. Um, where the project was replicated before it was installed offshore. As you can see, the penetrations coming through the deck was quite complex, um, but it was installed successfully and uh, passed the pressure test and it was, um, it was in service until the end of the life of that asset. Sound deadening and vibration elimination. As I mentioned, uh, it's a, a, a SPS polyurethane has a sound deadening and vibration uh, deadening properties. This was uh, applied to the bottom shell plating of a um, new row row ferry, passenger row ferry running in the Mediterranean, um, overlay and underlay, which means it can be, SPS can be applied on, on top, from on top or from below. Uh, it eliminated the unacceptable sound and vibration prob problems. Um, they had the noise attenuation vibration from the propeller. Um, this again, was not structural, it was more noise and vibration. Six mil top plate, 25 mil core. And it was completed while the vessel was in service. And one of the last applications that we um, have developed with our partner company, TSG Marine, um, is a pipe repair. And this is a class approved permanent repair for pipe work and tubular structures using SPS technology. And as you can see in the image here, it's basically two uh, steel clamshells bolted around a live pipe. So there's live medium, no need to shut down the pipe. The clamshells are prefabricated, brought to site, bolted together, and then the SPS polyurethane, much like the flat decks or vertical decks or above head, is um, injected in between the new collars and the existing corroded steel pipe, um, reinstating it back as a permanent repair while the pipe is still in service. So ideal for discharge overboard um, lines on an FPSO, for instance. So thank you very much for your attention. As I mentioned at the top of the presentation, if you want to copy along with some notes, please contact me on this uh, email address. and I'll be happy to, to answer any other questions and share some of the details that we've gone through uh, this evening.
Back to you, Ranjeev. Um, thank you, Yana. That, that's a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, now the floor is open for questions. Um, I have seen one uh, question that has come on Slido. Uh, the question is, the class approval is likely to be needed to support a repair proposal. So are there any limits to class approval of repairs? For example, repairs to the hull, probably this is something you, you might have already covered in your presentation, but I think for the benefit of answering that question, probably it'll be really useful to go into the details. Yes, uh, very good question. Um, so with SPS, um, we say that the existing or the parent material, for instance, the deck, the existing deck can corrode down to 50% of its original uh, thickness, which is, you know, a, a lot, a lot more than what normal crop and renew rates would be. And that's globally. So if we're talking 50% on a global scale, um, some of those areas will have quite deep pitting, um, little as maybe one or two millimeters left in, in the existing deck. Uh, but generally, as a rule, when we present to, to class um, a repair solution, the ultrasonic thickness measurements, which will be provided to us to assess the design criteria for the SPS, you can see how much globally uh, material is left on that deck. So we generally would say as a rule of thumb, again, globally, not localized. Globally, we would um, be able to go down as far as 50% demunition from its original plate thickness. Um, hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think that's uh, that. I think that seems to be. Um, yes, that is, seems to answer the question. Uh, probably one question I have here is while we're waiting for any follow up on that or any new questions. Uh, you just probably follow up on, on the questions you just mentioned. Um, uh, you mentioned about deck, diminution of the deck plate and uh, the SPS adding to, to global strength, and that has been approved by class. Uh, probably as a Neville, I'm just wondering how uh, this SPS plate that has been added in conjunction with the deck plate, which is already existing, act as a single kind of kind of a, a web part of the girder, hull girder how that integration is, is, is made. Um, in one of the, the slides you have shown, you talked about bolt, bolted to the existing plate uh, for the strips before you put the top plate and adding the elastomer. So how you get that bonding to make sure that the whole plate act as, as, a, as a web of the girder, hull girder. So how do you get that efficiency in bending? Yeah, good question. So um, if I answer that uh, in, in, in two different um, parts, so part one is a fully welded solution um, where the perimeter bar is placed directly on top of the existing deck where an under deck stiffener is present. And so it's welded to the existing deck. Then the top plate is welded on top of that perimeter bar. So from a impact and load path point of view, it travels through the SPS um, if, it's, if it's in the contact in that area, perimeter bar and onto the, into the existing deck structure. Now, if any impact happens in the center of the panel, that energy is then absorbed by the uh, polyurethane core and dissipated over uh, the panel size, but not just the panel size, because if there's other panels that are connected to it, then that energy is further dissipated through other panels side by side. Um, the SPS cavities, when they are laid together, so we'll say if you have a, a deck that's a thousand square meters and, and each cavity is 20 square meters, um, that whole deck is acting homogeneously as, as one unit. Um, it's connected at key points to the existing structure, so it's tied back to the uh, existing deck uh, while protecting it. So the the good thing about SPS is that it's got top plate continuity throughout the deck itself. And when you come to the edges, then uh, the perimeter bar itself is extended out and then chamfered down to the existing deck as well. So the, so, so the, the message we take it is it's efficiently integrated into the hull to make sure it acts as, as a globally as a structural element. Okay, so there is another question which has come through can SPS apply 
while water ingressing, for example, a crack in the bottom or as a hole on the hull, probably. Yeah, so we, we, we've done a, a few projects um, where we've had uh, through hull penetrations. Um, traditionally, we would see them underneath the bell mouth or the suction pump, um, where the, the plate has thinned um, and you know you can get, a, in some cases, a, a 20 to 30 millimeter hole. Um, what we do traditionally is we, we plug the hole. We can either spike it or you can use a chapa plug with a diver from, from below, try seal it. Um, once it's sealed, um, then we maintain the area to be dry before we install the SPS cavity. So first of all is to assess the hole, if it's going to grow um, or if, if, if the water has been arrested as such. Um, but we do require the, the area to be dry. And um, when we close the SPS plate in, we do different tests. Um, and one of those tests is for uh, dryness and, and humidity. And uh, uh, yeah, we have, we, have, we have a very, very stringent QA process, but uh, I suppose answering the question in two parts, yes, we have dealt with uh, through hull penetrations um, before, um, and we have a repair procedure in place for that. But the area does need to be dry to apply the SPS. The polyurethane itself in its liquid format doesn't like the moisture. Yeah, I think that's very clear. Um, yeah. Uh, the next question I have here is, um, so probably related to the first question, I believe, so are you able to take credit for global strength for bonded or bolted perimeter bars as the load would need to be taken by the adhesive bond or the bolts? So basically, it's just probably a follow on questions uh, from the previous one. So yeah. are you able to take credit for the global strength for the bolted or bonded perimeter bars? Yeah, yeah. So uh, SPS uh, in, in, in the bolted, uh, section you're, you've got a mechanical fixing um to the existing deck uh so the bars do provide a load path but sps if you imagine the bolted side is purely there to keep the sps polyurethane core between the two top between the top plate and the bottom plate in place that adds to the whole global strength so the sps within that 20 square meters panel side by side contributes and increases to um, the, the the global strength of the deck. Okay. Uh, next question I have here is: How difficult have you found to eliminate all air pockets or bubbles from that sandwich area? Um, and what is the impact of having these within the uh, polyurethane if not fully removed? So basically, what is the impact of air pockets and how how good or how well you can eliminate them? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> very good question. Um, during the uh, installation process uh, on an asset, we would generally work out where the low point in the cavity is. Uh, it's very, very uh, rare, shall we say, that you'll get uh, a completely flat cavity um, when you're working on floating structures. So we always inject from the low point. Um, we also make sure that when we do the injections, as you saw in the animation, the ventilation holes in uh, each of the corners or any of the pinch points where we think the air might get trapped or not being able to release to get to a bigger vent, we put mini vents in. So there's no limit to how many ventilation ports you can put in a panel um, or how close they need to be to uh, any of the corners where an air trap might take place. Um, we've done extensive testing um, over the years um, to make sure that any air traps um, through watching polyurethane flow through the cavity um, are eliminated. Now, as part of the post cavity uh, QA procedures. We do an acoustic test on the top plate to make sure that uh, we can um, test for any voids within the cavity that we have missed. But uh, in, in my career, very, very rare that, uh, that any bubbles will form and make its way back from a ventilation port. Ventilation ports, um, there's, there's also a head of pressure as well. Um, so when you're injecting the polyurethane as a liquid as it runs through the cavity, it fills up through the ventilation ports when it, the cavity is full and the ventilation ports then uh, overflow, I suppose, and um, the air gets pushed out through with uh, as the only means of escape at the high points of the cavity. 
Thank you, Jan. Um, there's no question on the slide, but I have one question. And uh, in terms of the, the filling or in the sandwich, basically the, the, the polyurethane foam um, or the material, um, what kind of degradation mechanism can you expect through life or what you have observed uh, through life for, for the systems which you already fitted them or from any test you have carried out? So SPS is installed on the existing plate from the side, the affected side. So the side that's getting the corrosion or the erosion in some, in some uh, projects. When you apply the SPS, it acts like a triple barrier. You've got the existing plate, then you've got the design polyurethane core, and then you've got a new plate. So if you were asking for a 20 year extension of uh, repair in that area, to protect the existing plate for 20 years, then we would design it, as you saw in the presentation, with um, specific polyurethane core and top plate. But the existing plate, once the SPS is installed, the existing plate is sealed and no further corrosion from the SPS side will happen. SPS, the polyurethane core, is inert, so it's impervious to seawater, crude oil, it's impervious to, to almost everything. Um, so nothing will get through the polyurethane core to um, affect that existing plate uh, again for the for the life of the asset. Thank you, Jan. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, is it possible to open up, open the system up, say for a transit route, then repair the opened section? Is it so? You repeat the question. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, not... I think uh, the question here is: Is it possible to open the system up, say for a transit route, and then repair the open section? I, I believe the question here is probably to make uh, the the repair um, similar to the original design. I believe um, it's not very clear. I think probably the question here is: op Can you open up the system which you have fitted, um, uh, sandwich plate system? And I um, and repair the open section. That's I understand. That's how the question is, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Okay, maybe maybe if I elaborate on that. So once SPS is installed, um, is it can, can it be repaired? I think that might be the the question. Okay, so once <laughs> well, what, what, once SPS is installed um, for any reason that you need to uh, reinstate the SPS, it's a very simple procedure by uh, cold cutting the top plate and the polyurethane core and removing it away from the existing plate. Um, and then putting a new plate in place um, with some backing strips and then filling, re-injecting the void essentially with the liquid polyurethane again. So the key point here is that liquid polyurethane, brand new polyurethane before it solidifies actually adheres to um, solidified existing polyurethane inside the cavity. So you can carry out those repairs. So I think in, a, in addition to that question, a, a follow-up question might be, once you've installed SPS, can you make modifications? Yes, you can. Um, of course, we would like to know these predicted modifications during the design phase, but you know things change, especially in this climate, different cargoes need to be uh, carried. So you may want to install lashing pots or sea fastenings or um, la uh, welding pads um, on, onto your deck. You may want to have pipes running through the SPS deck all these things are possible post SPS. Um, we do have procedures um, to, to carry out that. So the SPS is very versatile um, in that field. Um, I have a number of questions uh, on Slido here now. Um, one of the first question is, how did the cracks on the FPS or diesel storage tank and Aframax tanker manifest themselves. So on the um, <clears throat> FPSO, it was uh, initially it wasn't designed as an FPSO. Um, initially, that vessel um, was 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 manufactured for other reasons, and then uh, the owners decided that they would buy it and, and transform it into an FPSO. So that ship was was lengthened with a new section in the middle. And as you saw in the, the diagram in the presentation, where the old section of the ship met the new section of the ship, those stresses from uh, different, uh, the diff different 
different steel thicknesses and, and different orientation of the stiffeners um, through that bulkhead, those different stresses and loads that formed the cracks in behind those longitudinal stiffeners and, and they, they began to grow and then obviously let uh, seawater in through them. Um, on the Aframax tankers, uh, that was just down to design. I think it was, it was carried out over a number of sister vessels also. Um, now the SPS was added to reduce future project future problems. It was actually repaired, as we see in the presentation conventionally, but the SPS was added to make sure that uh, it, 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 it reduced all those stresses by, by 25%. So. Um, I have a question from someone uh, in two parts. Um, probably I think it's best I will put both the questions to you at the same time. Uh, is SPS effective in reducing noise and vibration in accommodation areas? For example, from engine adjacent engine uptakes. That's the first part of the question. And second part of the question is, could ship staff remain living within the remainder of the accommodation if SPS was to be applied to cabin bulkheads adjacent to engine uptakes? So the first question is, is it effective in reducing noise and vibration within accommodation areas from adjacent engine uptakes? And second question is, can the ship staff remain within the accommodation while this work is being carried out? Yes, yes. Um, the first question, yes, it, it will reduce the, the noise and vibration um, in the accommodation sections. Um, we also would um, explore what fire regulations need to be adhered to as well in those accommodation sections. So the SPS polyurethane with a low K value would, would, would help in that region. Um, and yes, the, the, the crew, um, essentially we send riding squads on board vessels and assets around the world, um, small three, four, five man teams uh, or five, five person teams um, to carry out the works. Uh, so there's no disruption or there should be no disruption to the vessel or assets daily operations. Um, the in the sense of having somebody in the accommodation block, you just have to schedule it around when they're going to be in there. Um, but essentially it's standard um, ship working practices, uh, welding and uh, injection is all in a closed loop system. So there's not any uh, fear of um, vapors or anything like that. That's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's non has X, um, the whole process. I think that has answered the next question as well about the fumes. Um, I'll go to the next. I think there are a number of questions that are coming in. Uh, Ian, I think you're going to be busy for the next few minutes. Uh, okay. What area of, say, tank top or deck can SPS cover? Is there any limitation for instance? Could it renew a complete tank top or bottom plate in a cargo tank? Yes, yes. Um, so we've recently looked at... Um, uh, an FPSO um, in Africa for uh, seven, the complete SPS reinstatement of seven oil cargo tanks um, on, on a campaign, essentially. So there's no limitation to, to what we can do. As you saw on the slides, the FPSO side shell protection is over 3,000 square meters. Um, uh, but no, there's, there's no limitation. Great. Thank you. Uh, SPS achieved class approval to upgrade hull structures to ice class standards. Has this been successfully applied on existing vessels to achieve ice class? Uh, we are working with um, a Canadian client. We have class approval to upgrade uh, one of their vessels to a higher ice class um, to operate in um, an ever extending winter over there. <laughs> and. Uh, we haven't applied the project yet, but we have uh, all the approvals in place to to go ahead and carry out that, um, uh, and we hope to do that uh, that soon. Thank you. Um, what is the approximate difference in time scale for an SPS repair versus a crop and renewal uh, repair? In other words, what's the reduction in off air time you achieve by applying your technology? So it's. Um, Two, two, different, two different sectors, really. If you were looking at the marine sector and we take, for instance, a uh, single hull bulk carrier, 600 square meters that come alongside any harbor or any dock space uh, in Scandinavia, Europe, we can do 600 square meters 
uh, in 10 days, um, which is which is really impressive. We call it the SPS pit stop, where the vessel comes in and uh, it's fully turnkey solution, um, no no shipyard supports required. But again, if we work with shipyards as we have done for for many many years, 20 years now, um, they're extremely quick and very supportive. Um, we generally look at time savings that SPS is four times faster in the maritime sector uh, against traditional crop and replace. Um, if you're offshore side of things, um, because the existing plate remains in place still, um, if it, it depends. If you use a main deck, you don't have to go to all the trouble of, uh, you know, looking after the cargo oil tanks below, scaffolding, rope access. Um, if you do have to get inside one of the tanks to do hull plating issues uh, or longitudinals, then yeah, we, we again see a massive saving um, in time, but also in cost. I mean, uh, the offshore side of things, when you're not having to pay for dive boats, um, rope access guys, um, you know, we, from our analysis, uh, we are between 10 and 11 times cheaper than those alternatives when you take into account all the time that you'll save by just having a small crew on board. And that's it as well as manpower, you know, I mean, SPS uh, installation is not labor intensive. Um, so those schedules are, are pretty accurate. Um, you have mentioned a lot of uh, good things. What are the cons? For example, cost, space for machinery, injection, environmental or fumes, that kind of, what are the negative ethics uh, which you can explain anything yeah i mean this um the, the polyurethane itself um it, it, the, the, there's not really a risk with with fumes because we work in when well ventilated areas if we're working inside tanks or confined spaces you know like any like any works you, you'd insist on uh, forced ventilation and uh tank entries and things like that um other cons, we, we, we've kind of over 20 years overcome most of the cons, so our clients um, don't have uh, many cons. So one of them previously was um, that we had a, an injection machine that fit inside a 20-foot container, and obviously that's not going to fit inside a tank. So we then um, internally, through research and development, built the smallest injection machine in the world that can fit in through a tank hatch. So again, massive benefit that you don't need to cut the manhole opening uh, or cut extra access into a tank. And the good thing about SBS as well is that because you're not disturbing the existing plate inside that tank, you can actually feed smaller top plates into the tank and then um, join them up once they're in the tank to form a larger top plate. You can you know, um, use backing strips to join the plates together and then form one cavity and then carry out the injection. But yeah, over 20 years, um, 12,000 independence tests and you know, we've, we've kind of, hopefully overcome uh, any of the cons that uh, that kind of strike out. Has SPS been used in LNG carry repairs? Does it affect the ins insulation of cargo tanks? We have used it in LNG. Um, for instance, um, the LNG Bonnie, uh, some years ago, um, we completed in Brest, um, uh, and I know about that project because because I was on it. Um, and that was in the uh, central walkway. Either side had thin steel, so um, SPS was welded to the supporting stiffeners framework um, in that walkway, rather than a welding to the existing deck with the sensitive uh, cryogenic membranes on the other side. So. Um, we have performed works on LNG um, vessels before. And the key thing with that is that you maintain that the SPS uh, hot work is um, kept 25, 30 millimeters away from the uh, sensitive areas, shall we say. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think probably we could take it the one, last one or two questions. Um, offshore semi-sub uh, pontoon tank repairs or protection. Has this been done? I believe probably you mentioned about semi sub protection on that has been carried out on. So probably I believe this is talking about offshore. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. So standard um, standard project for us uh, that, that that one of our clients in particular, um, if it's alongside and they need pontoon. 
protection from dropped objects. Um, we actually have a dropped object uh, application for, for um, offshore assets, uh, whether it's pontoons or on the deck. Um, but specifically, while a semi-submersible is in operation, for instance, in the North Sea or in the Gulf of Mexico, um, the client doesn't want to take it off station when they find that the pontoon plate is thinning. And so what SPS uh, can do is, um, while the rig is in operation, go down uh, into the pontoons. Um, I'm thinking just one of our clients, every semi, every, every semi sub is slightly different. So some of them you can't get in because they use this ballast, but some of them you can get in uh, where they've got thruster and pump rooms, um, for instance. And then you install SPS from inside the pump room or the thruster room. Now, in some other applications, as I just mentioned, the semi sub that uses its pontoons for ballast, then obviously you're not going to get in during um, during operations impossible. So you got to wait till it comes alongside. But the good thing is that you can repair those pontoons alongside while it's floating, um, as long as you've got access into the pontoon itself. Um, doesn't need to go to dry dock. Okay, I think probably relating to the previous question. Uh, the question maybe about spray or getting it dry. Um, so I understand from your responses that it has to be dry and it's generally, if it is done offshore, it is done it from inside. Yes, yeah. Um, the next question is, what is the, the maximum temperature SPS overlay can withstand? Withstand, again, that's down to the design criteria. Um, you know, what, what temperature do you need it to withstand? Um, because we can design a thicker top plate, we can design, um, the polyurethane core, for instance, uh, if it's a thermal or a weight issue, we can actually, um, de we, we've developed something that, that we've just installed a project where the core had to be quite thick. So instead of having solid polyurethane for the whole core, we uh, introduced a bubble core method where uh, polyprop polypropylene balls were introduced to the panel and the SPS uh, polyurethane was injected while the balls were in the panel. So the balls took up 50% of the volume you're able to increase that um, thickness of the SPS panel. Um, so it wasn't completely solid and it saved on the weight. But again, that's got a, a huge thermal um, thermal break inside that panel. Um, but yeah, operating temperatures, we've, we've operated um, on, every, on every place around the world, really, bar the Arctic and the Antarctic and, and uh, hoping to get some projects in those areas at some point. <laughs> I hope so. Um, probably the question I, I believe was probably referring to the surface temperature, surface temperature, maybe, uh, or maybe hot surfaces. Uh, I believe um, that question was. Uh, so, do you have any indication in terms of the temperature of the surface where it can be applied, the bare metal? The bare metal. Um, bare metal temperature, probably. Okay, so if there's if there's an exhaust pipe on the other side or something, and it's uh, it's uh, if it's up around, you know hundreds and hundreds of degrees, then then we would have to look at, at how we would install the SPS. But, you know, if you're looking at anything up to 100, 120, 130, that kind of stuff, um, that's quite standard for us. There's two, there's two parts to a question like that, uh, that comes from someone. One is the installation temperatures, you know, um, we generally say, you know, what is ambient, but then we work in very, very cold climates. And sometimes you might need to introduce some, uh, you know, heating in the area um, to, to, to make sure that everything's not frozen. <laughs> um, and then likewise, you know, you might need to inject in the evenings in the Middle East. We've had to do that when the temperature has been, you know, 45 degrees Celsius. Um, but it's all about control um, and we can do that, no problem. And operating temperature is, uh, is, is different. So it needs to look at, Instead of installation temperatures, operating temperatures need to be taken into account during the design phases. You know, for instance, that vessel we spoke about earlier, upgrading it to a higher ice class, obviously going to operate in, in a lot colder areas. So that's taken into account during the design phase. Thank you, Jan. Um, there is a question about the turnaround time required. For example, establish problem or solution, and how long does it take to work up the solution and to mobilize to site? Um, it depends on the application. So um, we, for a unique application where it's quite tricky, the maximum amount of time would be uh, six to eight weeks. But for we, we've, we've attended emergencies for clients the next day. Um, so it purely depends on, on a lot of variables. 
but we're not talking um, we're not talking months and months. If, you, if you're looking at a new application for prefabricated crash decks, for instance, on your oil rig, then there's going to be uh, a design phase um, of, a, of a couple of weeks, and there's going to be interaction with class of a few weeks, and then there's going to be a fabrication point in one of our facilities of a few weeks. And so you're looking at, you know, instead of a, a one to two month window, you probably look at a kind of three to four month window that way. But um, if you know, we, we pride ourselves on looking after our clients and making sure that uh, we can help them out when they need us the most. And, and, and we have had uh, quite a few calls over the years, funnily enough, around Christmas time and New Year's. <laughs> they, end of December, they seem to go, Ian, I've got a problem, I've got an issue. And then, and then we, we go, no problem, we'll, we'll get it sorted for you. And we get somebody on a flight and we get them to the vessel and, uh, or the asset and, and, and and when we work up a solution with them, uh, ideally, we would, uh, you know, like to have an on-site inspection. But uh, during these interesting times, shall we say, some some of that is is, is not possible. So we have to rely on uh, instructing the guys on board the asset or the vessel to provide uh, the information that we need to uh, draft up a, a tender specification for discussion, and that's usually done within the first 24, 48 hours. And uh, yeah, we can. We can move quite quickly is, is, is the answer. Um, and uh, But we, we can move quite quickly, but we like a bit of a heads up. <laughs> and uh, that, that helps so. Uh, hope uh, the upcoming December, um, Christmas, you don't get that call. Yeah, um, thanks. <laughs> probably just a quick couple of questions. Um, if you can make it very short answers. Um, how can you access the areas? Um, probably very difficult uh, areas such as air conditioning and refrigeration machinery. Um, and reinstate without removing the machinery, is it possible? Um, that's a question. Yeah, so um, if the deck around the machinery is uh, corroded, we can apply the SPS in and around intricate um, machinery spots. We've got a project we're running right now, actually, in a machinery space where uh, it's, it's about 100 square meters, but there's you know, 40 cavities. So every cavity is going to be between two and three square meters. They're, they're not, they're not big, but they're going in and around the machinery foundations. We're tying in to make sure those foundations are secure and they're not uh, a risk to the project. Um, I'll flip that on its head to say that what if you've got, for instance, a generator on board a vessel or an asset and the deck below it, right underneath it, uh, where you cannot access because it's, you know, two inches um, of head height. Um, then instead of taking out that generator through the side of the ship or through different decks, uh, compartments, we would go into the tank below that, um, generator and we would reinstate the steel from below. We can weld to, uh, or we can fix the SPS, uh, top plates in between the under deck stiffeners and reinstate that deck underneath but spread it out a little bit more uh, past the uh, generator size so that it behaves more in a global manner and ties back into the original structure. Uh, thank you. And I think there's one last question. What is the minimum existing or new top plate dimensions and also the, the core thickness? I think probably the question here is about the minimum existing plate. And sure, plate sure, plate. sure. Yeah, great question. Um, so we we as again this is this is purely for design if the design criteria allows it we can go down to a 15 millimeter core that's one five 15 millimeter pu core um and our um citadel access protection doors are about three millimeters of steel either side of a of a 15 millimeter core door because they need to be light enough for the crew to move into position um so yeah so I'd say three or four millimeters for the steel. Um, you got to remember though, during the design criteria, when you're putting hot work on a piece of steel that is that thin, um, you got to look out for you know deflections and, and things like that. So it, we would design it as per the requirements, um, and we would advise yeah the th a thin core. But as I say, there's if you need a thin core and a thin top plate due to weight, then we've got solutions to make sure it's lightweight. So that, that's coming to the end of the questions, uh, Ian. I think there are a few people on the slide um, thanking you, Captain Kapila, Liz, Mark, et cetera. So, and from our side as well, on behalf of Aberdeen Maritime Branch, 
I would like to thank um, Ian for your time today to make this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Ian, and good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.